thing that I, I mentioned to the worship team tonight. I said, um, I think God wants us many times to sort of step out of our comfort zone. That we get comfortable in, in our worship. That our worship yeah, becomes man. like this. I am worshiping God. I worship Him only on this note and nothing else. How boring would that get after a while? It's driving me crazy. I know, it's driving me crazy too. F always does. But anyhow, God wants us to step out a little bit and get out of that. I mean, if we only worship God one way, man, if you only kissed your wife one way, would get boring after a while, wouldn't it? Well, let me tell you something. God wants us to worship Him not in the same way all the time. Amen. He wants us to step out a little bit and to truly worship Him in spirit and in truth. Amen. So can we do that tonight? Can we truly worship Him tonight in spirit and in truth? You know, step out a little bit. Can we do that? Keep on the fire. If you're in the battle for the Lord and right, keep on the fire and light. If you're with my brother, surely you must fight. Keep on the fire and light. There are many dangers that we all must face. If we die and fight again, it's no disgrace. Coward in the service, he will find no place. So keep on the fire and light. 
struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you, holy, holy. Disciples were getting concerned. The wind started violently blowing, but he was asleep in the stern. Does he not care that we perish? We're helpless and we're so afraid. And Jesus arose when they called him, and he said to them, Where your faith because you prayed all night because you've held on with all of your might child your cries have awoken the master
spirit here tonight just looking out over the crowd and seeing some of the things I'm seeing tonight especially from that row right there but uh yeah yeah but it's good to be in God's house tonight how many of you all saw on the news about the meteor did you see that about the meteor strike over in Russia and about how many people I don't know what the count was about how many people were killed or something like I heard 1100 injured or something like that and and um, it was, they had video of this meteor. I mean, it looked like something out of Hollywood that you saw this light coming down through the sky, getting bright, 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 and then all of a sudden you heard boom. And buildings were knocked over, windows were knocked out for miles around. They had video of, of some place over there where it knocked in the door. People, I mean, it was horrendous. And they had no warning whatsoever about it. How many of you all would have been ready had something like that struck around here? How many of you all would have sit back and said, well, you know, I'm ready to go if a meteor was to hit right here. You see, those people had no warning about it. And if they were the ones that were unfortunate to die in it, you know, hopefully they knew God. You know, and the thing is, is we have no guarantee of tomorrow. We've got no guarantee of the next moment. And that's why we ought to live each moment like it is our last and to worship God like this could be the last time we worship him. You know, when we pray like this could be the last time in this fleshly body that we're going to pray, you know, live each moment like, you know, God, this could be it. And I want to live this moment so that. Well, how many of you ever heard of a person named Claude Ely? Claude Ely, if I'm not mistaken, wrote the song, Ain't No Grave, Gonna Hold My Body Down. You know how Claude Ely died? I'm not trying to be morbid or anything. He was playing music and fell over dead, worshiping God. You know, when that time comes, what are we going to be doing? Amen? You know, what we got to realize, people, is we got to live our lives just like God could come back any moment because he can. There's no guarantee. And I think, you know, one thing we need to do is pray for those people over there in Russia uh, because they had no warning of that happening. 
over there. You know, science will say, well, we're monitoring every asteroid. We're monitoring all the stuff going past us. And yet this one slipped through. Hmm. Man don't know it all, does he? But God does. God does. Aren't you thankful we serve a God that's great enough, that he knows when everything is going to happen, he knows the hairs on our head, and that Dave doesn't have any hairs on his head. I'm sorry. I just looked over there, Dave. God knows that, and I'm glad we serve that kind of God, aren't you? Amen. amen. Can we give God a praise off tonight? Can we just? Amen. Amen. When, uh, when Keith told me the person that's going to come up and do this tonight, I, he had to resuscitate me. Uh, but uh, Kathy, come on up. Yeah. Cricket, you guys have something tonight? Get something together real quick. First of all, um, I didn't do this several, it's been a while um, since Keith has been out of the hospital, and I forgot to thank everyone for their prayers and thoughts that, for him and for me. <laughs> and um, you have to forgive me, I'm a little nervous, but it's Malachi 3, 6 through 10. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you turned away from your decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you asked, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you asked, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a cause of... You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much, such a, much a blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Um, we are talking about tithes and offerings over our minister's meeting, and we need to have the tithes and offerings to s supply the stuff that we need in the church, and we want a bigger church, and we want more people, we want bigger stage and everything, so we want to, we need for the tithes and offerings to come in. So with that, the ushers come forward, and Dave, Will you say that prayer over the offering, please? While they're coming up and getting ready, I just want to say this, too, that... Um, you know, many times we don't have time to swing by the bank to pick up cash to put in the offering plate. So if, there was e if there's ever a time you're like, oh, man, I forgot to get money out to put in the offering plate, we can take care of that. Amen. All right? We have a little swiper thing that we can debit your account. So if there's ever a time that you're there and you're like, I forgot to get the cash out for my tithes and offerings, we can take care of that. Just see, I guess, who, who, who's got it? Oh, I, I've, got, I've got one with me, so, yeah. So, anyhow, uh, just, see, uh, just see someone on the ministry team. We can take care of that for you, okay? your hands and tell it. Lord, you're holy. Lord, 
Amen. Aren't you glad we serve that kind of God? Amen. You know, when you think about all the names of God, all the attributes, you know, it covers everything. There's nothing that's left out. You know, he is, you know, our deliverer. He's our strength. He's our strong tower. He's our friend. I mean, you talk about all the attributes. He's our healer. You know, he's the one that supplies our needs. You know, he is Jehovah Jireh. You know, he, he is all things. So that tells me there's nothing that will surprise him. There's nothing that comes upon us that God will say, hmm, I never thought of that. You know, there's nothing that we can ask him that he'll say, he can say, I don't know how to take care of that. Because he is all encompassing. That his, the names of God covers everything that we might experience down here. And aren't you glad we serve that kind of God? Amen. If you remember the, the ancients, you know, they had a God of this and a God of that. And, and if something happened, they had to try to figure out which God do I go offer a sacrifice to? Because I just don't know. You know, if I want a good harvest, I got to go to this God and offer to him. But then if I want rain, I got to go to this God and offer to him. And, you know, if I want good fortune, I got to go to this God. Aren't you glad we serve one God that covers it all? Amen. And the God that is the God of all gods... That he is the big G, not the little G. And that he is the one that put it all together. And you know, if he put it all together, he knows how to take care of it. Amen? If he created us, don't you know he knows how to take care of us? You know, just like we know how to take care of our children, God knows how to take care of his children. And I am thankful for that, that he knows what I need before I ask it. And then when I ask it, he's already got the answer on the way. I'm thankful I serve that kind of God. Can we give him a praise offering again tonight? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm thankful tonight. I'm thankful tonight I serve that kind of God. Uh, this Friday evening, uh, if you don't have anything to do, if you're not going to the uh, winter jam, we are having a jam here of our own, a worship jam at 7 o'clock Friday evening. So if, if you, know, you want to come and sing and worship, Come right on in here. You know, I guarantee you'll preserve your hearing better here than you will over where, the, uh, where they're going to be playing uh, Friday night. I don't know, is, uh, is, is Skillet going to be there? No? Oh, man. I'm sorry, Dwight. They're not going to be there. You know, we were, um, we, we were at a meeting one time, and I was talking about uh, Skillet and how that, uh, you know, I enjoy their music. And Dwight just looked at me. He's like, are we talking about a group? Are we talking about something you cook in? You know, so... Uh, <laughs> I love you, Dwight. Lori, come on up. Children's Church, quietly walk on back. Okay. I know. Today in our Sunday school lesson, uh, one part of it came out of Psalms that said, if I regard iniquity in my heart that God will not hear me and that to regard iniquity meant to cherish that sin and hang on to it you know if we got sin in our life guess what God's ear is not inclined to hear us yes he does hear but he can choose not to answer a prayer if we have sin unrepented unconfessed sin in our life we got to get that out of there. And when I knelt and I asked for forgiveness, his blood fell. And it covered a multitude of sin. And he no longer holds those sins against me. So if he no longer holds them against me, I ask you not to hold them against me. If I have wronged you, if I have spoke to you in a way you think that I, I, I hurt you, I apologize. Because I don't want to have any sin. Regard sin, hold on to it, cherish it. I don't want any part of it. And if I've done something even unknowingly, you know, I want to make sure it's covered. Always. Have your sins covered daily, every day. Don't wait. When you mess up, do it right then. You may not have the opportunity to do it later. Always be ready to keep that heart 
before God. Sin is a captive, it binds and it holds. Satan will try to abolish your soul. There's only one hope for your destiny, and that one hope. Isaiah 43, and I'll be reading 15 to 17. Y'all stand. (laughs) 
and it says, I am the Lord who opened, I am the Lord, the, your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth a mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candlewick. Can we pray? God, I come before you right now. Help me with this and help my dad be able to bring forth the word. So in this passage of scripture, you all sit down if you want to. So in um, this passage of scripture, God is saying that he is the creator of Israel, that um, he is their king. And he goes on to say like what he, what he did for Egypt, I mean what he did for the Israelites, bringing them out of Egypt, bringing them out of bondage. He parted the Red Sea and when Egypt was coming after him, he kind of like swallowed him up with the Red Sea and all that kind of stuff, so that's cool. What did he just say? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, God did some pretty cool stuff. He parted the Red Sea and lead him out of Israel. But we're supposed to forget all that. <laughs> In Isaiah 43, 18, it says, but forget all that. Right. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. Amen. Amen. I used them to throw you guys off a little bit tonight. <laughs> Amen. Did we throw you off? I even dress like this tonight. These are my praying pants. This is what Rhonda calls them. She says they're my praying pants because they look like they're worn out in the knees. But um, seeking the Lord for something to preach tonight, and I was reading over these scripture verses, and they stuck in my head. We've heard these scripture verses preached a lot. Somebody say amen. amen. And oftentimes, we forget actually what the meanings are. The reason I use those guys is because when they came up here, often when we see our babies get up to do something for God, what we do is we just go, oh, isn't that cute? Somebody say amen. That's my baby up there. And aren't they just so precious, right? But how many of you actually listened to what they said? How many of you actually understood what they said? Wayne used the first few verses there. It says, I am the Lord, your holy one, Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned their lives, snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. Now, that's pretty awesome stuff. You remember when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt? When he brought them out, Wayne said it, he... God financed their exodus with the money and the treasures from Egypt. He brought them through all this awesome stuff. Many trials, many battles, many obstacles that, you know, they thought would take them out. God even allowed a big mighty army to come up behind them, scaring them to death pinning them up against the Red Sea, wondering how in the world they were ever going to get out of this, and even asking God, God, why did you do this? But God opened up the Red Sea for them. He took them on beyond that point. What did he do? He fed them. Not with McDonald's, but he fed them with manna from the sky. When they whined that they were sick and tired of manna, God gave them quail, Right? And when they were thirsty, he didn't give them a Coke, but he gave them water out of a rock, which to me is cooler than going up and having like 50 different flavors in a Coke machine. Somebody say amen. But then wise Delena, another cute child of ours, she got up and she spoke. And what did she tell you to do? Forget everything Wayne said. 
You know what she said? Forget everything Wayne said. Now, to me, there's wisdom in both of what they said. She said, forget it. You know who said to tell you to forget it? God said, forget it. It's awesome all the things that God did for you in the past, but God is now saying, forget about that. And here's where I want to preach at tonight. Forgetting about all the good stuff God did for you in the past. Can you think about that for a minute? Forgetting about all the good stuff God did for you in the past. We often testify of all the great things God did for us in the past. And the thought, Steve, that comes to mind when I was reading through this, it just kept coming over. And it's great to remember the past. And usually I get up and preach and tell you to forget all the bad things that happened to you in the past. But this scripture verse here is saying forget the good stuff. And here's the thought that came to mind when I was reading this, Shelly. We need to forget about how God did it in the past. You know why? The thought that came to mind was this. That becomes the standard. Are you listening to what I'm saying? What God did in the past now becomes your standard. Butch, God took care of you 10 years ago, whatever. God miraculously did things. Now that becomes the standard for how God is going to do things in the future. I asked Gloria, I was quizzing her a little bit in the bedroom. I said, what does a preacher look like to you? I didn't say male or female. I said, what does a preacher look like to you? Most of you would not describe the way I look tonight. Am I right? I'm wearing tennis shoes, blue jeans, a white shirt with a weird-looking colored shirt underneath. I'm even wearing black socks, man. I'm not even wearing white socks with my tennis shoes. Do you realize that I don't fit the standard for a preacher? I don't fit the mold tonight for what a preacher looks like. You know why? Even myself. Steve, when I sit and think about awesome preachers, who comes to mind? Ray Hughes. Would Ray Hughes ever get up and preach in something like this? In a sanctuary, no. In a camp meeting, no. He always had a suit on. Ties, everything, suited up, everything set, ready to go. That's the way the man preached. And in our minds, Dave Turner, what has happened is the standard for a preacher is a Ray Hughes. I'm going to tell you guys a little story here. Norman's not in here, I don't think. Yeah, you are. All right. A couple years ago, more than a couple years ago, he and I were at an MIP, not MIP, church growth training down in Madisonville, Kentucky. And I was sitting in a class, and some of you may have heard this story. I was sitting in a class looking forward to the teacher that was going to get up to teach us. And something happened that that teacher could not get up. Well, Dave, in walked the weirdest looking human being I have ever seen in my life. Hair funky. I think he had gauges in his ears. I'm not sure. This, to me, is tame compared to what he was wearing. And as soon as I saw him, I mean, it's like, you have got to be kidding me. I drove all the way down here, paid all this money, and that is going to teach me. Well, my goodness, I could get up and teach him. First of all, and how to dress if you're going to stand up and teach a bunch of ministers. I'm having all these thoughts, and I mean, I have this instantly built up in me, this distaste for this person thinking, that is not a minister of the gospel. I shut him down, man. No doubt crossed my arms, shaking my head, thinking, are you kidding? (laughs) The guy gets up. He starts telling me about his ministry. Telling the whole class about his ministry. 
He's from Baltimore. His ministry ain't like my ministry. I get in a sanctuary, I get up behind a pulpit, I preach, man, I do weddings and funerals and all that good stuff, visit hospitals, counsel people, deal with whatever comes my way. This guy goes to the bar. We all thinking. A preacher that goes to the bar. I was like, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Weird. I knew it. I knew this was coming. You don't dress like that and get up in a pulpit and preach. There ain't no way. So he tells me that on the weekends he hits the nightclubs in the Baltimore area. I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> and he said, you know, I go into these nightclubs on the weekends, and what I do is I stand around drinking pop. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> sure you do. Me and a couple of my buddies, man, we sit over in the corners, and we stand there, you know, and we're just hanging out. I'm like, yep, checking out the chicks, right? <laughs> Getting a few phone numbers and so on and such. Yep, I'm sure of it. And then he kept talking, and he was telling us, what he does there. And again, don't forget, in my mind is this already hatred for this person because he's not doing it the way I do it. He keeps talking. And he starts telling us what he does. Dave, he's standing at the bar, and when people come by, he creates a conversation with them male or female, and he's always got somebody with him, he creates a conversation with them, and he starts talking to them. Talks to them pretty much about anything they want to talk about. And then at, when he has a great opportunity, he interjects. He changes up the conversation. Now, mind you, he looks this way. He's in a bar. And he interjects that I start talking to them about other things. And he, at one point or another, starts to drive the conversation. And what he has proven to do, and if I remember correctly, he built a church doing this, a pretty decent-sized church, he would direct the conversation to things that were wholesome. Notice I didn't say holy. He would direct the conversation to things that had nothing to do with the nightclub, had nothing to do with the things that they were drinking, had nothing to do with the chicks dancing on the floor. He would begin to talk to them about wholesome things. And Norman, he went on to say that through that, he began to win people over to God. Now, when I was reading this story, reading the scripture today, that thought, that story came to mind about that guy. I instantly, immediately judged him, shut him down, ignored him, pushed him to the side because he did not look the way I thought he should look. But the man was effective in what he was doing. You see, what we read here in 18, and Delana read it really well, but forget all that. You see, in our mind, a preacher is a guy in a suit, and guys, I understand it. I, I don't feel very comfortable up here right now. But I, you, you should dress your best when you get up behind a pulpit. That's my opinion. But Dave, when you're out on the street corner, you're not wearing a suit. When you're out at the hardware store, you're not wearing a suit. But does that make you not a minister of the gospel? No, it does not. You see, the last time I heard, these things right here did not call me to preach. When God called me to preach, he did not say, Wayne, I'm calling you to only have a pulpit ministry. Wayne, I'm only calling you to preach inside the four walls that you designate as my house. 
Wayne, I'm not only calling you to be a man of God on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and Thursdays, revivals, conferences, tent meetings, or whatever. He says, I've called you to be a child of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, I'm sorry to tell you. It's not possible to wear a suit all the time. I can't stand them. The, I used to have to wear ties and stuff to work all the time. Buddy, you get sick and tired of wearing ties all the time. I don't want to comb my hair most days. That's why I keep it short. I'm serious. A little bit of gel, put it in there, buddy. I'm out. I'm done. It's over with. I don't want to comb. I don't want to dress up all the time. But does that not make me a minister? No. God told these folks here, he said, I want you to forget how I did it in the past. And saints, there's a reason. Because like I said, the way God did it in the past becomes your standard. And you know what the thing is? If we always think that God's going to do things the same way all the time, every time, we're going to be messed up. We're going to miss out on the blessings that he is sending our way. Somebody say amen. Let me tell you another story real quick before I get moving. Some of you have heard this. Lori and I were going through a really tough time in our, in our marriage, financial problems. And I was praying to God for God to help us to meet our needs. And one particular day on my job, God decided to meet my need. But not the way I wanted him to. Are you hearing me? I expected Dave Turner, dressed the way he is, to get a signal from God. You know what I'm talking about? God just pierced through that bald head of his and say, you know what? Wayne needs X number of dollars. As soon as you see him, put it in his hand. That's what I expected. But, Brian, what happened is a woman who was a smoker like you would not believe dehydrated because she drank tea all the time, never drank any water, crotchety old woman, mean, came up to me and said, God told me to give you some money. Well, immediately in my mind, I said, no, 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 thank you. I'm not taking money from you, you sinner lady. You know what I mean? And I know how she got the money, man. Her sister won the lottery and gave her some, and she wanted to share it. So I'm like, no, thank you. I'm good. You've heard this story some of you have. I walked out the office door, and if I ever heard God speak to me ever in my life, it was that day. What do you think he said? You idiot. He didn't say to me, oh, loved son, <laughs> you with dideth stupideth. <laughs> I'm using the King James, okay? <laughs> That's not what he said to me. You idiot. You pray to me and ask me to meet your need. And when I gave you an opportunity for your need to be net met, you slapped my hand away and said, no. God, that is not the way I want you to meet my need. God, I want it to be in my own mind the way that I have built the, the rules for receiving blessings from you, God. God, that's the way you have to do it. That's the way you did it in the past. People in the past, man, you get that brotherly or sisterly handshake, man. Yeah, ooh, all right, man. You know what I mean? That's what you expect. But you don't expect somebody that you don't even consider a Christian to walk up and hand you what God wanted to give you. That's why God said, forget all that past stuff. Forget it. Why? God doesn't want to do it that way anymore. Can I say that again? He already did that. Nobody expected him when, they, when the children of Israel got up to that big body of water. 
Pharaoh's army coming down on him. He did God, nobody expected God to open that up. But now God has already done that. And let me read some scripture to you here. Delana read more than I, what I wanted her to. Obviously, she doesn't listen too well, but I'll keep going. 18 said, but forget all that. My NLT says, it is nothing. <laughs> Parting the Red Sea, God is saying, it's nothing. Sending manna down out of the sky, God is saying, it's nothing. Amen. Sending water out of a rock, God is saying, it's nothing. Drowning that whole army, Dave, that was bearing down on you, that's nothing. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. Now, to me, that was awesome. But God says, it's nothing compared to what I'm about to do. And since it goes along with what you and I are talking about this week, we got to move on outside of our box a little bit. We've got to change the way we think. Let me read on. It says, for I am about to do something new. Do you know what new means? It means new. Never been seen before. Never been touched before. Never been witnessed before. You've not seen this before. There's not a standard for this. It's never happened. God says, I am about to do something new. And then he goes on to say, see, I've already begun it. Do you not see it? That's a great question. Because here's what's happening. In our lives, things are happening around us, but we don't see it. Somebody say amen. amen. Things are taking a place around us, but we don't see it. Why? Because our mind is set. That it's not possible for God to do it the way he's doing it now. Hmm? I've not had the suited up preacher come to me and witness to me and, you know, lay it out in front of me and prophesy to me and tell me all the things like they did in the past. I've got a preacher in blue jeans and tennis shoes and a white shirt telling me. I've got a little kid standing up in front of me in church telling me to forget about all the past. A little kid. He says, don't you see, I've already begun to do it. Yeah. God, help me here because I need assistance. Amen. I need you to lead me. Yeah. Somebody ask a question about the way the Bible reads sometimes. Some of us believe what the Bible says. The Bible says the sky's blue. Dude, the sky's blue. Some people say, well, it's not technically blue. It's kind of a mixture of green and blue and red and all this other stuff. We, you know, we put our own, am I right? We put our own thinking into it. But if the word of God says the sky is blue, the sky is blue. Amen. Regardless of your thinking, your logic, your understanding, whatever, if the Bible says it's blue, it's blue. If God says, I want a holy child, I want my children to call upon me for everything, not just some things, I want my children to have a relationship with me, Lori, they've got to not have any sin in their life when they call up on me. You know what we say? Well, does God really, is God, is he, is he mean? Is he loving? If God says if you've got iniquity in your heart like Lori taught this morning, he's not hearing you, listen to me. He's not hearing you. There are benefits to serving God. Those standards have not changed. Robin, if you are a child of God, anything you ask God for, if it is in his plan, it's yours. Somebody say amen. If you believe in God the way you're supposed to believe in God, when you ask him for it, it is yours. Amen. Now let me say this to you. It has to be by his standards, 
Not your standards. Not the world's standards. It has to be by his standards. Amen. Preacher, you're preaching hard. No, I'm not. God is about to do something new. The standards haven't changed. You and I have to be as close to him as possible. Amen. Don't you see that I've already begun to do it? Do you know what we focus on as Christians? We don't focus on the fact that we are drawing closer to God. Tessie sent me a text this week and said, God's trying to get me to do a new thing. And my response was, praise God. God's messing with you or something like that. I love it when God starts to push on his people. I love it when God starts to speak to them. I love it when God starts to drive them crazy and tell them, you need to get rid of certain things. You need to get things out of your house. You need to act a different way. You need to start praying more. You need to get on your knees and fast more. You need to get in the Word. I love it when God does that. You know why? Because he's already started doing something new in your life. Listen to me. When God starts speaking to you, saints of God, that's new. It means, first of all, there's no more sin in your life. He's hearing your prayer. He's talking to you. He's telling you what you need to get rid of. Wayne was praying this morning, and I won't tell you what he's praying about, but some things he's struggling with. And I told him, I said, Wayne, that's a good thing. He looked at me a little funny. It's a good thing that you're struggling. Misty's giving me a look. How is that possible? You're struggling with things that you're not used to doing. Am I saying that right? You got to get quiet. You're struggling with things that you're not used to doing. It's easy if the world says, do this, okay. Right? We got a lot of Christians today that do anything and everything the world tells them to do. Somebody say amen. Amen. And then they wonder why God's not meeting their needs. You, you got sin in your life, I'm sorry to tell you. But when the world says to do something, you're like, no, I'm not doing that. When your flesh starts to rise up and say, do this, and you say, no. Now, saints of God, that's a battle going on inside of you. You understand? That's the flesh wrestling with the spirit. Amen. And if that spirit's strong enough, you will beat that flesh. Amen. Amen. So if you got a 15-year-old boy wrestling against the flesh and he's not doing what the world's telling him to do, but he's still wrestling with it, what does that say? He's doing it right. Amen. Amen. The world says, no, keep doing what you're doing. Nope, God's telling me to get rid of this stuff. You're doing it right. You're doing what God wants you to do. Why, Wayne? Why is that right? Because you're walking away. From an old lifestyle that used to have you bound. And listen to me. If you're listening to what God is saying, if God is saying get rid of that, don't do that, and you're listening to what God is saying, Rhonda, that is a good thing. Somebody say amen. Amen. God says, don't you already see? I'm doing it. You're battling You're wrestling with the flesh. You're killing the flesh. You're putting the flesh down. Yeah, you're struggling, but you're winning. Let me keep on going. I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Focus on this with me for a minute. I will make... A pathway through a wilderness. Sister Shelley, for you to understand that scripture, you got to use your imagination. Okay? Deer hunters in here, raise your hand. Have you been in some thick woods? Have you? You know what I'm talking about? The thick kind of woods where you kind of have to aim your gun properly so you don't hit a tree. Right? All right? You've got to do it just right to hit that deer. And then when you shoot that deer, what do you got to do, Dave? You got to track through the woods, man, to get over to it so you can get the prize, right? Well, what is this scripture verse saying here? I've made a clean path through the wilderness. Are you hearing me? 
I've made a clean path through the wilderness. I've given you a path. All you got to do is stay on it. Somebody say amen. Sometimes that clean path is the hardest thing to stay on. Why? Because you got all kinds of people trying to pull you off over into this section or to pull you off over into that section. But Wayne, if you start listening to what God says, God says, no, you keep on going straight. And then what does he say? I'll create rivers in very dry places. Sister Joyce, you'll be going through times in your walk with God where you're not receiving the blessings like you want. Somebody say amen. Amen. You'll be thinking it's battle after battle after battle after battle. All I got to do is pray constantly. Why am I fasting all the time? Why am I always reading the Bible? God, can't you just give me something? You get dry in parts, Dave. And when God says it's time, you'll be walking through a dry place and all of a sudden, bam. You have to realize in deserts, there is no water. You understand that? In deserts, there is no water. But if God says there's a river flowing through a desert, there's a river flowing through a desert. Are you hearing me? What is God saying there? He's saying, look, guys. You got to start looking at things the way I see things. When you see a desert, you don't think I'm going to die there. (laughs) When you see the Red Sea, you don't think, man, Pharaoh's got me now. I'm dead meat. Right? When you see a wilderness, you don't think, man, I'm going to get in there and get lost and never get out. You don't look at it that way. Are you hearing me? When there is no money in your billfold. Listen to what I'm saying. The electric bill's coming due. You don't sit and worry about it. When there's no money in your billfold and the electric bill's coming due, you don't sit and worry about it. Are you hearing me? Pastor, that's easier said than done. You've never been there. Wrong. Wrong. Dave, there have been times I've sat and worried 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 and not changed the situation one ounce. And then God, being the punk that he is, he meets the need regardless of my doubt. Now, this is the way I think, Dave. God's not some big meanie up there. He's waiting to prove me wrong. And then when he proves me wrong, I think he's doing a jig in heaven saying, I told him. If he'd have listened to it the way I told him, if he'd have done what I told him to do, he'd have a few extra hairs on his head. There wouldn't be as many grays there. There'd be less scar tissue in his heart from where he worried all the time. If he'd have just trusted in me, if he'd have just kept his eyes fixed on me and his heart fixed on me, he wouldn't have had to worry about none of it. What is God saying? Forget about the past. When you look at that wall, you look at it as a barrier, don't you? I can't get through that to get to the other side. Right? God doesn't look at that as a barrier. Amen. The things you're dealing with, it's not a barrier. It's not something that's getting in your way. It's an opportunity. Can I say that again? It ain't a barrier anymore. That's not a mountain anymore. That's something that can be picked up and tossed into the sea. Give God a hand clap, please. (laughs) God goes on to say after this, through the prophet, he says, the wild animals in the fields will thank me. The jackals and owls too, for giving them water. In the desert. You know what he's saying there, Lori? Reminds me of a scripture in the New Testament. You know, the birds in the air, they don't worry about where their food's coming from. They don't worry about where their water supply is coming from. You know what God is saying there? You need to be like the animals. They ain't scared. They're not worried, Norman. They know it's coming. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people can be refreshed. 
That's interesting. You see, we look at trials and tribulations as horrible things. It's a place where we grow stronger. Do you like to be right? Who likes to be right? How many parents like to be right? Tell your kids are wrong. We don't have many kids in here, but how many kids like to prove your parents wrong? <laughs> Rosie always thinks she's right. I'll just go off on a little sidebar here. You all think she's great. I used to live with her. I know better. Amen. <laughs> Things that we face, we need to start looking at them not as obstacles, but as opportunities. We need to stop thinking the way we're thinking. Somebody say amen. When we're going through the dry times, it's a time of building. It's a time of strengthening. And when God says it's time for you to be refreshed, you will be refreshed. Can I say something to my ministers here? One thing I know about ministers is this. Sometimes we grow impatient with the calling that God has given us. You know why? Because it's not going the way we want it to go. I'm not seeing the success that I want to see. But you know what I read about in the scriptures? When it's time for us to see the success that God wants us to see, We'll see it. Amen. When it's time for us to be refreshed, God will refresh us. Somebody say amen. amen. Saints of God, listen to me. It is our job as his children to stop worrying about the things in the world and start looking for God in the strangest of places. Does that sound crazy, Tanya? Start looking for God in the strangest of places. How many of you honestly go to work and look for God there? How many of you don't? Norman's saying, I don't. <clears throat> if he's not there, guess what your job is? Take him there. Amen. If you're in a tough situation... Where there is no God there, Wayne, like in school, it's your job as a child of God to bring him into the situation. Amen. If people around you don't have faith, give them faith. Amen. If people around you don't have a, a, a kind word in their mouth, give them one of yours. Amen. Amen. If they don't know how to raise their hands, teach them how to raise their hands. Do you hear me? Saints of God, it's not our jobs as children of God to sit and think about all the great things God did in the past. It's our job as his children to know that there are far greater things coming down the pike and it's not ever been seen before. Norman, that excites the daylights out of me. There are things coming my way. You know why I say my way? Because I am saved. I believe in God. I trust in him. I call on his name daily. I get in the word. I sing praises to him. The word of God says when I do that, there are blessings coming my way. You know what? You have nothing to be ashamed of as a child of God. You have nothing to be ashamed of of being a Pentecostal person. You have nothing to be ashamed of for raising your hands and calling on the name of Jesus. Why? He'll take care of you. He'll meet all of your needs. Amen. Don't you see? He's already doing it. He's already doing it. Got a text today from somebody who said, Pastor Wayne, God told me to do something, and I did. I said, praise God. It was a hard thing, Pastor Wayne, but I did it. Praise God. Saints, listen to what I'm saying. You should be getting excited right now. Amen. Wayne, I gave the devil a black eye yesterday. How? I didn't listen to what he told me to do. Uh, Norman, we should get excited about that. You got up here and was smiling and laughing this morning. You came in depressed. You're not depressed anymore. We should get excited about that. The world will say you can't get your joy unless you've got a pill. 
Dave, you're not going to get your joy back unless you go back to drinking alcohol. Wow. That is such a lie. You know what you got to say? I've been clean now for three years, and I'm happier now than I've ever been happy in my life. Somebody say amen. Is that the truth? That is the truth. Saints, God is going to do things that you and I have never seen before. Do you believe me? Do you believe me? I believe, Julie, there will be people walking the door that we never dreamed would walk in the door. And can I say this? There will be people preaching the gospel who have never dreamed that they would preach the gospel. I used to hate it as a kid. Because it seemed like when I'd go to some of those conferences, the preacher thought that everybody in the room was going to be a preacher one day. Brother, you going to preach gospel one day? No, I ain't. <laughs> Brother, there's an anointing on you. You just don't know it yet. No, there's not. Amen. Anybody ever said that? Anybody ever said that? But nor if we stop and think, we know that God's always tugging at us. Ron, he's always pushing us to go further. Why? Because, Julie, there are things that you and I will do that we'd never, ever dream that we would do, ever. I was praying with Mary this morning, Vicky's sister. She sent me a text this week, and it said, Pastor, I'm ready. Do <laughs> you know what that does to a pastor, man? That woman lives over an hour away, and she's telling me, Pastor, I'm ready. When I see you on Sunday, I'm ready. You know what that says? I'm ready to get saved. I know there's going to be obstacles. I know there's going to be problems. I know there's going to be trials, but I'm ready to get saved. I'm tired of running from God. I'm sick and tired of living a, a, a life that is beneath what God has for me. I'm tired of it, saints. That is awesome. Amen. You know what I told her when she prayed this morning, gave her heart to the Lord? I said, Sissy, it's, it's in you. You have the ability to go re reach your whole family. You have it in you. That family's enormous, Dave. She has it in her to go just to reach that whole family. Amen. You know what we think? We're not capable of doing awesome things. Steve Farrell, we ain't. Amen. <laughs> and when Jerome, when we allow him to get in us, we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Somebody say amen. <laughs> That means preaching the gospel to a family that's not ever been saved. Amen. That means standing up and giving a testimony that puts people in tears. My brother, Friday, Jim, he got up. He always puts himself down. He always lessens himself. He's not smart enough. He doesn't speak good enough. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. And he got up and spoke about his wife who was laying right here. And Steve, I thought he spoke very eloquently. Amen. And he had people in this crowd in tears. Dave, on the day your wife's laying here in a casket, he's up speaking to them about all the things she has done, talking about how great God is, and people are in tears. That is something he's never done before. It's brand new. Amen. Something brand new, Dave. And you know what he did that day? Mm. You hear what I'm saying? You hear what I'm saying? He gave the devil a black eye that day that he will never forget. My wife may be gone, but God, I still believe in you. Amen. Amen. You know what he kept saying all day long? Everybody that came through that line, Robert, he kept telling about how God did this and how God did that and how God took care of her and how God took care of him and how God provided this and how God provided that. I don't know how many times I heard it. Word for word, every single time. Never once said, mean old God, he took my wife. Mean old God, I wanted him to give me two more days with her. He didn't give me two more days. Remember we said that prayer? 
He didn't give him two more days. It wasn't God's time. But you know what David said or what Jim said? A couple years back, I asked God to give me two more years. God may not have gave me the two more days, but God gave me two more years. Isn't that awesome how God is? Let me have you stand, please. I pray this message spoke to you. And I got to tell you, I was eager to get up and preach tonight because I didn't preach Thursday and I didn't preach this morning. Norman did a great job this morning, by the way, didn't he? Amen. (laughs) Do y'all ever get tired of me preaching messages like this? Because in my Bible, what I find more than not, Steve, the Bible is littered with scriptures like this. Littered. What does it say to us over and over again? God's going to do this. God's going to do that. God will take care of you. God will make a way when there is no way. Right? He'll take a mountain and toss it into the sea. He'll open up the Red Sea. He'll drown the enemy that's behind you. When you think you don't have food for tomorrow, it'll come down out of the sky. When you don't have money to pay the electric bill, the electric bill money will show up somehow. Somehow, some way, it'll happen. When your car's broke down, they're telling you it's four-wheel drive, transmission, motor, everything. God comes back and says it was just a fuse. That's God. That's God. God will give you the strength and the words to say when your wife's laying in a castle. Norman, you'll have family members cussing you out, but God will somehow give you the strength to deal with that. If we're brave enough, He'll give us the words to say to see our family members saved. I say this he'll give us enough wisdom and knowledge Maxine listen to this he'll give us enough wisdom and knowledge that when God really starts to work on your family to change their lives to turn them around you won't sit and worry about what he's doing because you'll stand back and say God I know doing it. Am I right, Norman? Yeah. God, I know you're doing it. You'll have a guy standing in front of you saying, there's no way in the world I can get a new car. Arguing with you, yelling at you, telling you that you can't do it. follow God's principles when you do what the word of God says when you apply it properly blessings come your way here's the funny part when you least expect it maybe bow your heads please I want to talk to you right now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed if you're not saved the altars are open please come I'm not trying to make light of it, but if you're not saved, these altars are open. And let me tell you, if you're not saved, you're living a life that is well below what God wants you to live. You're living with doubt. You're living with fear. You think that everybody's out to get you. Everybody's out to do you wrong. You think that everybody's mean. Nobody likes you. That's not what God wants you to think. That is not how God wants you to live. Please hear what I'm telling you. That is not a life that God wants you to have. It's not. If you're not saved, these altars are open. Please understand me. They're open. Saints, God really wants us to start looking for new things from Him. Brand new things. He's going to send you places that you think, why am I here? And when you get there, he's going to start revealing it to you, Steve. 
You're going to be introduced to people that you've never been introduced to before. And you're going to be scratching your head, God, they don't look the way I think they should look. But they're going to have something for you. You hear me? They're going to have something for you. You're going to encounter little children that are saved. And Steve, they're going to be able to give you advice. I know what you're thinking. I ain't taking advice from a child. The Bible says unless you become like a child. Are you hearing me? Sometimes we got to listen to those kids. They have faith that you and I don't have. They believe in God when you and I don't believe in God. Are you hearing me? I feel God right now. Will you raise your hands with me, please? Just start thanking God. God, thank you. God, thank you. God, thank you. God, thank you. God, in the past, you've taken care of me. You've done some pretty awesome things. But God, I don't want to focus on those things anymore, God. Father, I want to keep my eyes fixed forward, God, so that I can't miss what you're going to do. God, open up my eyes and let me see the great things that you've already started doing in my life. God, open up my eyes, God, and let me see you moving on my child. God, let me see you speaking to my child at nighttime when they're sleeping. God, let me see that you've got your hand on them, God, when they're going to school every day. God, let me see that you're moving upon situations, God, that I never dreamed that you would move on. God, let me see it. I'm going to pray the prayer of the prophet. Father, open their eyes. Let them see you. Oh, God. God, let them see you. God, show them, God, what you're doing. Let them know, God, that you're already tomorrow. You're already Tuesday, God. You've already got it taken care of. God, the blessings are already waiting to be released, God, when you say it's time for them to be released. is going to follow the leading of the Lord right now. If you've got your hands raised and you're not afraid, I want you to step out of your seat. I want you to walk as long as you want to walk. And I want you to start thanking God for everything that he's going to do. I want you to start telling God, God, I thank you for the brand new way that you're going to fix my problems. God, I thank you for the brand new way that you're going to move in my home. God, I thank you for the brand new way that you're going to move on my job. God, I thank you for the brand new way that you're going to use me in your kingdom, God. Father, I thank you for the brand new way, God, that you're going to touch my spouse. You're going to touch my family. God, I thank you for the brand new way. Don't be afraid. Please don't be afraid. God wants to do something new, and sometimes that means you've got to do something new. It means you've got to get outside your comfort zone. That means you've got to step outside your box sometime. Come on, saints of God. Don't be afraid. Praise God.
Lord tonight. Some of you still feeling it. That's awesome. Praise God. Let's give God a hand clap. We have a new lady here tonight. Her name is Glenda, the good witch of the north. I threw that in. It's Teresa's friend. She asked me if I could remember Glenda. I'm like, yeah, Glenda the good witch. I can remember that. Um, let's all stand, please. Make sure you greet her and Teresa. Teresa's been coming really good. Been doing really well. Be looking for new things from God. Will you do that? Will you do that? Look for new things. What used to be an obstacle for you is not an obstacle anymore. Amen? It's not an obstacle anymore. It's an opportunity. Amen? Dave, lead us out in prayer, sir, would you? Oh, Shelly? shelly got something to say. Hold on. still does that, doesn't he? Amen. Dave, lead us out in prayer, buddy, if you would, please. Amen. Shake hands and be friendly. Amen. Oh, it was wonderful. It was so nice up here.